Media Group for Monday, the 18th of October, 2021. John Lavedia back with you. I survived a week in the desert. Hats off to, actually hats on to my friend Stuart Wilde, the Llama King. I see Stuart. Good to see you, brother. You held down the fort last week. Thank you for that. Um, you know, we were shooting guns, rolling around in the dirt out in the desert, which is one of my favorite things to do. So uh, I do see also here we got Missy and Bob, Ivia here, she who shall not sleep. Uh, Justin's here, Lindsay, Sonia, Taringia, the mighty Sonia from Ottawa. And uh, of course, Virginia Pipitone. Uh, today we're covering part two of the um, Atomic Habits from Mr. Clear. And, uh, and I've got it here. Um, once again, thank you, Stuart, for, for covering the, uh, I guess, the intro and in the first three chapters you covered last week. Um, I sent an email out letting everyone know we're going to do the next three chapters, but we're actually going to do four because that chapter seven is just like a little thing hanging off the end there for that first section. So uh, we're going to do four chapters here. There's like a couple pages in chapter seven. But wow, wow, I've never read this book before. And, and part of it, and we're going to open it up for discussion, and I'll start because this is my first exposure to this book. Nice. Um, part of it is like, yeah, of course. I, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. So I'm giving myself credit. I'm like, yes, yes, see, I know stuff, damn it. I'm good, you know? But then the way he breaks things down um, so that other people can take it and use it, I really appreciate. This guy obviously put some thought into this. You know, it's like, well, what can we do? Not just, you know, here's the theory about it, but what can you do right now to make this work for you? So thank you, Mr. Clear. Um, I'm enjoying the book. So uh, who else has some insights that they've gained from, uh, well, I guess it's this next uh, entire section we just read. The first law, make it obvious, is what we're covering this week. So that was chapter four, five, six, and seven. Seven, just a couple pages, but... Who's got some thoughts about this? Come on yes. out, Missy and Bob. Yeah. First of all, you have to thank me because one of the very first uh, daily success calls, I told you I was reading this book and about the 1% mm-hmm. improvement. You said, I never heard of this guy in <laughs> this book. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm going to take credit for that. Oh, it's all um, you, Missy. Yes. It's, all, every, it's me. You, you, you. Yes. But we did, we did one. We're, we're starting it, you know, but at the atomic level and Stuart made the great, the great analogy last week, because when you think of the title, you think of an atomic bomb blowing off, but we forgot that atomic is the smallest, you know, particles in the world. And just what is it? 1% at the end of the year, you're 37% better. I'm like 67%. So mm. I must be, have exploded. I don't know. Wow. But, um, uh, Stuart was terrific, and um, these three chops were great, and it, it, we're putting it into practice. You know what's interesting, too, is that the, the declination of 1% decrease per day yes. does not accrue as severe of a curve, because you're losing, what, 1% of... A smaller portion every day. Yeah. yeah, so that 1% increase sure does look different on the chart. Very different. I really like the math behind that. I like the visual of the, you know, the chart. Um, wow. Good stuff. Glad you're getting a 2% improvement is what it sounds like, Missy. So good for you. <laughs> how about, uh, how about Ivia? Come on out, Ivia. <coughs> Excuse me. Still getting over this little cough thing I had. So um, I was just literally just listening to the recording from last week. And of course, I got two surprises. I saw who the host was and I said, no, you got to be kidding me. So I just sent him messages on Skype to say, yeah. what? Yeah, Look at so the that, cat was, that was did. a nice yeah. surprise. <laughs> and then you got me thinking, Stuart, about the whole atomic thing. And as soon as I saw the, the book title, I thought atoms are really tiny things that we can't see with the naked eye. So that kind of like, that was where I went with this, that it's minuscule changes to what we do every day. And then I started thinking, because I, I, I got on this whole, I, I used to be a couch potato. I'll put my hands and feet up and just fess up now, right? But as you all know, I don't sleep that much. I'm constantly active. I've gone into the gym. I'm, I mean, I'm now a gym bunny. I've got dumbbells at home. I've got a cross trainer at home. I mean, I'm running around the place and they probably think I've lost my mind, right? I'm running minimum 10 kilometers every day. And then I'm walking. So I'm doing on average 
on a good day, 30,000 steps. On what I call a rubbish day, 17,000 steps, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what I said to myself was every year and every month, I've got to be doing better. So my step count has to be more. And when I look at September versus October, October has to be an improvement on September. So, and I say to myself, if it means, so my week start from, my week start from Saturday, no, Sunday to Saturday. That, that's, that's the way I do the weeks and how I get the step count. So on a Sunday, which is my rest day, I kind of like say, okay, fine. If you are going to have a rest day, because I believe you've got to rest the body at some point, then that means from Monday to Saturday, I've got to do whatever it takes in those six days to make sure my average step count doesn't drop from the previous week. And if it does, then it means the next week I've got to make up that deficit. Because once again, October has to be an improvement on September, right? So I've got that in my head. And, and I say to myself, I don't care if it rains, if it snows, if it's a blizzard, whatever it is, there is no excuse. If it's really hard and I can't do my run, I'll do the cross trainer. And I've picked now the most craziest person on YouTube to follow. He does a hit thing where he does flat out sprints for like 30 seconds and then a minute and a half recovery time. I mean, I, I die when I do this. But for the first time today, I did two sets of this. I did 40 minutes of this nonsense, right? And I thought to myself, I'm still not where I should be on a step count for the day. And so I thought, yes, it's been raining, blah, blah, blah. But guess what I did? At half past eight tonight, got my coat on, scarf on, trainers on with an umbrella. And I went and I said, I don't care if it's raining, I'm getting my steps in, right? That's because I've said to myself, that's the change. I'm not going backwards. I'm going to improve on that. Now, I thought I was doing this to be physically fit and, you know, fit into my clothes better, blah, de, blah, de, blah, you know, all the stuff, you know, you want to look good when you go out. And of course, COVID happens and nobody went anywhere last year, right? But I was on a call for two hours today at work. And what were they talking about? Menopause and the effects of menopause in the workplace. Now, it was my birthday last month, it was a significant age, and my body's been going through some weird and wonderful changes. But of course, I didn't connect the dots because I thought, ah, oh, I'm not gonna sit and moan and have a pity party, blah, blah, blah. But being on this call was like aha moments, light bulbs are flashing left, and I thought, what is this? What has been going on, right? But I just thought, you know, with allergies and nah, 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 ah, it's just my body doing its thing. But no, and one of the things they said was diet, exercise are two things that actually help people cope better with that transition. Now, I didn't know this because I've never researched the topic. It's, you know, it's kind of like when you get there, you'll face the music kind of thing. So I don't start worrying about what's going to happen five years down the line, 10 years down the line. But on this call today, it was like, crikey, that's what's been going on with me. Uh -huh. But what some of the women were describing, I thought, thank goodness I'm not having it as bad as they are, right? But I didn't know that having started this whole stupid gym bunny, whatever process, was actually going to stand me in good stead for 2021, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, I've been making incremental changes, the 1%, whatever it is, but there's even a bigger reward for me because now suddenly I'm here and everything I've done before now is helping me navigate this period in life a lot better than the old me. The old me would have been a disaster. I mean, I would have crumbled, fallen apart. I, I, I would have been useless to myself and everybody else, right? Wow. So I'm kind of like thinking at some level, the universe knows what's coming. Well, when we get this brainwave sometimes and you kind of like think, is it me suddenly want to be like superficial? Am I trying to keep up with the Kardashians? You know, whatever it is, is going through your mind, right? That you want to wear these sexy things or whatever. But who knows? It must have been the universe like preparing me for now so that I'm going through this change, but I'm actually happy going through it. I'm, I'm, I'm more than survive. I'm actually thriving going through this, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm not getting the disaster stories and I'm hearing other people on a two hour call go about and go, I need help. Where do I go for this? And I'm thinking, really? It gets that bad? So yeah, having read these chapters, that's what was coming up for me. And I'm like, yes, I'm so glad. I'm going to keep doing this. I can't give up now. So I've even got more of a motivation. 
um, to carry on. So my environment is set up. I got my corner where the cross trainer lives, doesn't move from there. The only thing I need to get now is a non-slip mat so that it, I don't fly all over the place when I do this stupid 30 second sprint thing flat out. But yeah, every space now, I mean, I have my home office. It's, it's brilliant. So everything he was saying, uh, yeah, I, I just was like, check, check, check. I was like, yes. So yeah, it was, it was really great. Yeah, to read the book. Wow. <laughs> Vivi, are you sure you're not just lucky? Right? No, no such thing as luck. <laughs> I don't right. believe in that. No, <laughs> you put in the work and right. you're set up for when that time comes. I don't, right. I don't believe in luck now. Right. Well, obviously, right. We you know, <laughs> tend to believe in luck around here, but, but the, um, the idea that the ignorant bystander may have, oh, well, Ivia, <laughs> she's having, uh, a much more survivable or, you know, less discomfort or whatever, you know, she's lucky. Uh, well, no, she's prepared. She's in shape. And whatever the initial motivation was to, to get off your ass and do exercise or whatever, fine. Okay. But what, what did, what did clear say in the, it was the first couple of chapters, right? Was you guys covered last week. Um, so it's not about the goal. Don't fixate on that. Right. <laughs> Marry the systems. And so, and so in that way, you've got now what resourceful habits. I, I don't know, like, is, is a goal in there to be like a marathon runner or something? I, I don't know. So that's not a motivation. Okay. And yes, keeping up with the Kardashians, whatever that means, that's valid too. <laughs> that's valid. Okay. But look what just happened. So, so you're saying, you know, the universe knows, well, you're part of the universe. So, you know, intuitively, you know, go do resourceful stuff, right? I'm, this is. If he, you know what? You're awesome. Just awesome. Oh, thank you, John. So are you. <laughs> yeah. So glad you're here with us at two o'clock in the morning. Um, Lindsay, Lindsay Dollar England has her hand up. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. I was going to say about what Evie said about having to outdo yourself every month or every week. And I do that. And it wasn't until I, I did gymnastics for years and years and then it was just like even when I turned 30 I could still tell me I, I mean I can still do it but I was like and I've always been small anyway so I never really thought about it but the fact that I was out of shape I never knew because I was always just small until I started you know everybody said when you hit 37 I was like but I don't think that's true I think that got in my head and I was like so when I turned 34 35 I started making it a habit and then like doing the habit stacking and man, I was out of shape. I was like, Oh my gosh. So yes, that does work. And now it was just became a, a thing where I have to be faster than my kids, which now they're both like a head taller than me. So it's a little bit harder than that, but that does work. And you know, when he talks about the one, one space, um, one habit, one space, it all just goes together, which, you know, I'm in a small space. So, I mean, I have one space for, mul you know, multiple things, but I still have to take the time to refocus and make it a different space in my head. Maybe like a trigger that I, I get up and I do something. So it's not the same space because I am limited in my house. So that has helped a lot, but the exercising and out, you know, I guess becoming the best version of you I'm not in competition with anybody. It's just me. But uh, there's some, just some, some great nuggets in here. And But I think when he talked about lack of self-awareness, that was like, yeah, I was not self-aware that I was out of shape. <laughs> but, I mean, that could go with so many different things. But now, I don't know, the Q craving response reward, I don't know, it just all goes together, but I think right. That does fit with it, and even with you know work, it, it's the same thing. What are you doing to habit stack and make it a um, habit? Which I had the exact definition written down <laughs> that Stewart provided last week. That it it made sense. You know, you don't think about it. It's a habit. So that's when you really. I don't know. I felt like ah, yes, because I could. If I even, it's rare I take a nap, but if I fall asleep, if I got still, and 
I would wake up and be like, oh gosh, I look at my Fitbit. I'm like, I've got to hear my stuff. What are you doing? It's 1130. I'm like, I've got 30 minutes. I've got to get this in. You know, it's, but it just does. It becomes part of who you are. Mm. So. You mentioned uh, the cues, of course, which is um, this whole section of the book is about making it obvious yeah. or in chapter seven, making it invisible. Right. So there's the counter to that. But the the idea he even mentioned somewhere in the and I think it was uh, chapter six. Well, hey, I live in a, a, a postage stamp size apartment in New York City. I don't have different spaces. Yeah. Right. Um, so, all right, well, what can you do? You can, you can create environments with cues. And now when I'm sitting on that couch, I do my reading. And now when I'm sitting in this chair, I do my work. I think we talked about this, um, maybe a year ago, right. Um, in one of our general sessions where we can compartmentalize spaces for purposes, right? So when I'm in this space, this, this is work, this is the workspace. And I've got my, my implements, I have my tools, computer, microphone, right? Stuff. Great. Now I know what to do in this space because I've got the cues. Uh, right. But something else you mentioned, uh, Lindsay, was, was, you know, th those cues and, and things we're made aware of. What did he say in the book that we, we tend to buy what we're aware of? What was that experiment where they move the water in the, the hospital cafeteria or whatever, right. and they increased the water consumption habit and reduced the soda pop or whatever, just yeah. because you see it. Right. And I've jokingly, I've said, I'm on a seafood diet. I see food. I eat it. <laughs> right. Tray of cookies. Yes. Thank you. Uh, vegetables. Yes. Thank you. Right. Cheesecake. Yes. Thank you. So, <laughs> and why do they put the candy rack right there in arm's reach so for the kidding? children at the checkout? Right. Your kids will throw a massive fit and make you like an ass in front of everybody. Right. There you go. <laughs> you're like, right? oh. Un unreal. Unreal. Hey, Evie, you're back. Come on out, Evie. I was just going to say, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how many of you remember the backdrop I had in my old mm -hmm. place. Yeah. And I kind of like always used to joke. It was a wall of shoes behind me. Mm -hmm. But although I had like, I think my space was smaller than a stamp, a stage mm -hmm. stamp. But I knew when I had that backdrop behind me, that was my workspace, right? So now that I have all the space to myself and I'm the only one here, it's like, okay, I can have a dedicated office, but it always, always wasn't like this, right? But I still, within that small space, said to myself, when the chair is up and I set up a desk and I got the lights, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know how I used that space the way I did, but that was it. I was in work mode. And when all of that was put away, I did my dumbbell exercises in that same space. Right. I just took the chair away, folded the table, and that was it. It became my exercise space. Right. So, yeah, no excuses. There's a way to use whatever we've got and we can still get to where we want to get to. If we want to create the habit, we can. Um, you know, it's, it's yeah, no, no excuses. We, we really can. So, yeah. Well, he even mentioned that it's like the self control thing. The people who seem to have the most self discipline have also created what I would call an unfair advantage in the way that they've created an environment, but they don't need to have so much self-discipline, mm -hmm. right? He even talked about like the drug addict, the one coming back from, from yeah. Vietnam is now in a new environment. They had a very low um, rate of, of relapse, right? Getting back into heroin. Whereas the heroin addict goes to rehab, comes back to the same streets, 90, 90% relapse rate. Hmm. So is one like more moral than the other or better disciplined, more motivated? Great questions. But hmm, why about that environment? I'll take every advantage I can get. Right. Because I know I'm on a seafood diet. OK, well, then don't buy the crap. Just don't see it. All right. Simple. But the initial you know, impetus to do that has to come from some self-determined decision. I just love the idea of habits where he even said in the book, um, you know, I don't have to make decisions now. I even highlighted it. I don't have to make a decision. It's already made. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. What do you think, Bob? Well, I don't want to throw cold water on the proceedings, but this is going to come across a little bit like that. Listening to Ivia and Lindsay talk. Okay. Really wonderful. Really uh, fantastic and inspiring. But it sounded to me a little bit like you were making the 
means of improvement and end in itself. You know, particularly, mm -hmm. Lindsay, when you're saying, I've still got half an hour to do this, I'm going to do this. Uh, you know, the, I, I had a very close personal friend who actually drove himself crazy. And I'm not talking metaphorically. I mean, he hasn't been committed, but he really should be. He was a man who scheduled everything to the nanosecond. And he measured his success by how quickly he could get things done. And I was actually drawn into that because I was assisting him in a number of projects over the years. And every year he had one annual project that I helped him a great deal with. And every year it was, I got to beat the deadline that I set last year. It was a calendar. Let's be uh, very precise. One year he got the calendar out on October 15th. It was a calendar for the following year, obviously. And then the next year it had to be out by October 10th. He had to beat last year. And then it had to be out by October 5th, the next year. And he really did. He got to the point where he was timing everything, everything that he was doing. He became a slave to the clock, looking for that one additional advantage. So what I'm hearing, although, again, it's, it's great and it's admirable, meritorious, and, and I wish you all the luck, be careful. It sounds to me like you, you should be just a little bit careful about falling into the trap that he said at the very beginning, getting goal focused as opposed to being system focused. Mm -hmm. I hope I've got it wrong, but that's just the way it came across to me. Well, we just, you know, with Vivier, I said, do you want to be a marathon runner? That's not her motivation. But look at all the benefits that she's accrued from just adopting that system and other goals, whether she had them at the outset or not, that she can now more readily reach. Uh, will Lindsay always be able to outrun her her son? Um, no, no. Okay, but games. Now your friend who who you're saying probably should be committed. Uh, I guess he's a danger to himself and or others. Um, that sounds neurotic or psychotic. Okay, but is is you know is uh, Lindsay Lindsay's going to speak again? Come on out, Lindsay. But is her life based on being able to outrun the younger and taller? youth no uh, but a fun game i suppose right well it was till he you know he's nine inches taller than me now so obviously <laughs> i can win in the marathon where he can win in the sprint but no my mine is more it's something that I'm, I'm that i'm good at that i know that i can have the small wins it's not like i'm gonna i'm not gonna kill myself to do it or to beat mine it's just and some days i don't you know, some days I have to have down days that I'm like, I don't even look at it. I just take the Fitbit off. I'm like, you know, have to, you know, just, and I'm okay with that. So you do, get, do give yourself a break every now and then. Oh, yeah. yeah Knowing that the big picture is not going to be that badly affected by not meeting no. what you did for the day. Okay. No, no. It's just... A, a constant improvement but it also is something that I do better than I do other things so I it takes me longer to do other things even business related but it's something that I'm confident in that I can say okay I can build off that confidence and then I'm in the right I can go in like John told me one day to get up and do 10 jumping jacks before I make any calls and I'm like okay <laughs> you know let's do that and it worked <laughs> so it's just it, it puts me in the frame of mind is like, there's a win, now let's keep going. So that's fine, but no, I'm not gonna. That's a proper mindset. His friend is a little off, definitely. Okay, no, I could be crazy, but- You're not <laughs> no, you're well, We're not. all crazy in one way or another. <laughs> Don't worry about that. <laughs> well, well, as Bob said, you know, if the ends are, or the means are the ends, well, or cart before the horse or, you know, whatever other, you know, mental picture you can come up with that um, is the end result that you've, that you've produced the product five days earlier than you did last year. 
Is that even necessary? Now we're getting into neurotic extremes. Now we're getting into, you're never good enough. It's never enough, which he also mentioned in the book at one point, I was looking for it right now. I was just flipping through some pages, but does that serve you? I, I think not. I, I think not. Right. So as a person who's, who's fallen into that, that whole, um, I think somebody mentioned, uh, I don't know if it was on, on uh, maybe today in one of our sessions, the idea of, um, of uh, ADHD or whatever, you know, these, these oh, those, psych yeah, psychiatric yeah. labels that people put uh, so they can sell more, you know, drugs and stuff. But, um, but, you know, you go to this, that, this, that, whereas most of my life, I could, I could say I've experienced the opposite, which would be, I guess what they would call OCD, obsessive compulsive. It sounds like this guy was OCD, whatever that means. Right. Yeah. So I have to, I have to do more. It's never enough. Right. So um, neither one, sounds like balance or, you know, a healthy, you know, way of thinking or living to me, but hopefully your guy finds, uh, you know, finds peace. Isn't that, isn't that really the end result? Isn't that really the, the, what we're really looking for is here, how he talks to how the identity emerges from the habits, right? He even, he even kind of brushes on be, and then do, and then have uh, at one early point in the book, which you guys covered last week, but the, but the idea of being the best version of ourself, isn't that reward in itself? I think so, right? Being able to, to feel good in your own skin and, and, and just know, hey, I'm, I'm a high integrity person. Did I, did I run, you know, three steps more than I did yesterday? I mean, we could take that to neurotic extremes. And look, I, there's a guy who, um, this is a colleague of mine, his next door neighbor, is the guy who's run uh, or done, done 50 Ironmans in 50 days in 50 states. 50 Ironman, you know, competitions or whatever, competing with himself in 50 days in 50 states. Mm -hmm. And he does motivational speeches about it and stuff. But the guy's body is trashed, like, mm -hmm. like pain and like damage. And, and like, okay, I guess he's made a point. Um, I don't know that I could do one Iron Man, but he did 50 in 50 days in 50 states. Okay. Um, Ivier and then Stuart. I'm sorry, I'm taking up time here. Go ahead, Ivier. I think I just wanted to show my, uh, I don't know if you can see my mobile. So that just tells you the number of steps I've done so far this year compared to last year. And then below is October versus November versus September. Mm -hmm. So last year I was doing just over 9,000 steps a day um, on average, right? And now so far in 2021, I'm doing 12,000 and up, right? So there are days where I'm going to do a lot more. There are days I'm going to do a lot less. Like on Sunday, I did 33,000 steps and then some. Today, I've only done 16,000, right? So I listen to my body and I know what days my body wants to break and what days it doesn't. But six days a week, I'm active. I get the one day off where I'm not going to, you know, cycle. I'm not going to run. I'm not, you know, if I walk, it's just like, cause I have to get to the shop. So I just want to, you know, go for a walk after dinner or whatever, but it's not a training day. Right. So there is a lot of flexibility here, but today is only the what 18th of October. So I've still got almost half the month, right. To up those numbers, but it's the 18th. I'm not going crazy and saying, Oh my God, I'm less than. I'm not hitting the mark. I'm, you know, I'm not neurotic. No. The fact that I haven't done it and it's the 18th, I've still got days to catch up. Right. And mm -hmm. if for some reason, maybe work takes over, I can't do it. Then there's November to make up those figures. So that when I look back at 2021 versus 2020, I'm still coming out better. Right. So it's, it's a balanced thing. It's, it's not, yeah, I'm not competing against anybody else. It's just myself to make sure I'm in the best possible health right? And I feel good in myself because I find when I'm physically active, I'm more alert, you know, I get stuff done quicker. I'm happier. And it comes through in my voice, you know, on sales calls or whatever. It's just, I'm just me. I'm a better version of me, right? Um, and a random example is I, I took a recipe from uh, Seagull is her name. She's a, she's a chef, a trained chef. And she does something called a courgette cake or a courgette bread. The first few times I made that, it was shockingly bad, right? Mm. But if I make it now, it looks like it's been professionally made, like you bought it in the shops, right? 
And people go, oh my God, Ivia, you got skills in the kitchen. And I'm thinking, no, I've just done it so many times that I got it patted down now, right? Mm -hmm. And I make Japanese meals, I make Chinese meals, but this is stuff that I've made over the years, right? So every time you make something, you get better at it. That so much so that now I'm you know, I'm just adjusting the recipes to, to, to suit my taste buds. So when I have friends come over, I make my version of say that recipe and they go, dang, this is good girl. Like, did you, did you order this in? And I go, no, I made it. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah. They're like, but this is a full on Chinese meal. I said, well, yeah, the recipes, just follow the recipe. And they go, no, not everybody can follow a recipe. Right. But it's just doing stuff over and over again. You get better at it. Right. So that's just a random example of stuff. I sure. do. Well, you've also got distinctions now, you know, how that's supposed to look and how much time, oh, I see the color, right? So you can see things that the that the uninitiated, I can't even see, I, I don't know. Um, I've often said, hey, I'm not a foodie, right? Food's an inconvenience, as is sleep, right? I wanna work, I wanna do stuff. And yet, I'll, I don't think that I've ever said this in public. I make an awesome meatball. So I grew up, my mother, right? And my grandmother in Italy and all this stuff, right? So, so I learned how to make meatballs as a youth. And to this day, I can make a bitchin' meatball, okay? <laughs> in fact, we had a house party. We had the friends over. I had a birthday for my daughter or something. And I made this huge batch of meatballs and the sauce. And got, people were like, oh my God, this is the best meatballs ever. And um, I made them. And so... I guess a little pat on the back. If you want meatballs, I'm your guy. I can't cook it. I could make toast or whatever, but I'm just not interested. But apparently I, I know how to make meatballs. So, okay, <laughs> fine. I could see things with the meatball that most people can't see. <laughs> <laughs> I've made and eaten many a meatball. Stuart, the Llama King knows something about, I don't know about meatballs. He knows something though. I, as a as a recovering New Yorker, I know a whole lot <laughs> about meatballs. Um, and being married to a Sicilian uh, with a mother-in-law who can't have a holiday without making lasagna, I know all You're about lucky, meatballs. Man. As a matter of fact, Leah made meatballs this week. Oh. So how uh, how how uh, synchronistic that you that you bring such things up. Um, dude, that 50-50-50 guy, I saw that uh, documentary, uh -huh. and I have to say, I, I did a little research to find that guy because we were watching um, the Eco Challenge, and he was on one of the teams that did the New Zealand Eco Challenge, and it was the Ironman 50-50-50 team or whatever it was, and it was this guy plus three other people, and I was just moved by even the tidbits of that story that I went looking for it and I found that documentary. And boy, that guy got uh, hammered by haters on social media because he did like days in the gym as opposed to running. He did like indoor pool stuff, whatever it was that wasn't quite like the, the, the official Ironman stuff. He ran on a treadmill or ran on an elliptic and all these people were hating and he got hammered for like, people were accusing him of not keeping the money that he was, or keeping the money that he was raising for this What a bunch of BS, but boy, oh my God, the abuse that that guy put himself through and the no sleeping and the schedule and just the injuries and unbelievable to me, what a story of the triumph of the human spirit and uh, desire and will and all that stuff, unbelievable. Um, being science guy, uh, I appreciate this book because, you know, I, uh, I'm fascinated by what makes us tick and why we do the things that, that we do and all that kind of stuff and how, you know, he breaks it down into this really behavioralist um, psychology kind of approach as to, uh, you know, how we can get habits to stick and change bad habits and things like that. This chapter four, I thought was interesting because it was kind of about following our intuition with a capital I that um, comes from experience. And, you know, it's sort of like you do the thing long enough and your brain automatically starts to look for patterns, right? You start to recognize patterns. And what did she say? Our brain was a, uh, a pattern uh, prediction machine, right? But that really the function of our brain is to recognize patterns, solve puzzles so that we can 
uh, uh, free up cognitive time by creating automatic behaviors, right, or habits or whatever, super cool. Um, practical, uh, with practical experience, we can predict outcomes. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, and that you don't have to be aware of a cue for a habit, right? And that, uh, that you can notice an opportunity sort of unconsciously and act on it. And, and uh, Lindsay, I think that goes to uh, being in flow state, like you were talking about. And, you know, this, what, what is, what's it called? Autotelic uh, behavior, where it's just this, you're in the flow and, you, and, and situations arise and you just act um, intuitively without even thinking about it. He talks about the dangers of falling into old patterns and how easy that is. And before we can effectively build new habits, we got to get a handle on our current ones and that it's about being mindful, right? And self-awareness, like Ivy was saying, he dropped a young quote, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you'll call it fate, right? I think that mm -hmm. ties into a lot of the things that we talk about. Um, the conductor scorecard, I really like the pointing and calling. I did a stint in a restaurant and like every order that comes in, right? You're like, you know, cheese butter, good cheese butter, good cheese butter, whatever it is. <laughs> and you gotta, you remember that one, right? And uh, I remember doing that in a restaurant, right? You call out the, whatever it is, you call out the temp, everything that comes in. Um, and I think that, that really likens to the concept of the more senses we include in a behavior, the more it reinforces that behavior. So you read something, you say something, it's one thing. You read it and say it, and that's a different level. You write it, you read it, and you say it, and it just has that much more impact on our um, behavior. Uh, I always say uh, wallet, phone, keys. That's my little thing, right? She was talking about every time I leave the house or whatever, but I saw some Adam Sandler thing. I'm like, wallet, phone, keys. Um, how easy it is to get complacent when you do something a thousand times and you're likely to overlook the thing because you've done it so many times. The classic example to me is um, the mycologist who's eaten the, the um, edible mushroom, you know, a million times and they forget to double check one thing. Oh, uh, you know, whatever. Those are always the people that get poisoned, right? The people that die in avalanches are always the expert uh, backcountry people. It's the thing that, we, that, that we're most familiar with, the snake guy that gets bitten by, you know, the rattlesnake or whatever it is because we... Mm we drop our guard from uh, uh, being, um, uh, uh, you know, complacent kind of thing. Hey, I like Stuart, the, let me jump in on that. Yeah, real yeah, quick. Hell yeah. Because you're talking about, uh, or he quoted um, Carl Jung, until you make the unconscious conscious, it'll direct your life, <laughs> right? So we're talking about your, your uh, conscious awareness and your ability to confront what is, right? That is the hamburger. That is the train track, right? Um, and, and so I've done that same kind of a thing um, in my working environment to not become complacent and also to not be, um, well, you think of it like this. Let's say somebody was, was showing up for the job on day one at the factory, right? Uh, it's good for them to orient themselves. This is the lever, right? Touch the lever, smell it, taste it, whatever you got to do. Okay, but, but get familiar with that. So it's not a surprising thing. Uh, but then you mentioned complacency to to get over overly comfortable. This is something very fresh in my mind because I just experienced it this week, as did Linda, who's here with us, and Virginia. So we were at Front Sight Firearms Institute, right? And they were giving us a lecture and a handout on dry practice, right? So you're going to learn skills here. You want to practice at home. Here are the rules. And one of the rules for dry practice is that you prepare your environment. There's no distractions. You unload the weapon, you make sure it's unloaded. You, you close the door, you all the ammunition's out of the room. And you say to yourself, I shall now begin dry practice, right? And if anything distracts you or takes you away from that, you start the whole process over, unload the weapon. Yeah, you know it's already unloaded. Make sure you know that it's unloaded, right? And then when you're all done with dry practice, you announce to yourself, I am now done with dry practice, right? So it's extremely obvious to you that you're done and there's nothing complacent about that and now you load up and you know you don't take one more shot at the target in fact take the target down don't have the target there anymore right so i just thought that was very conscious very deliberate right of course the gun's unloaded no not of course not friggin' of course 
No, I totally thought about you guys on the range right. with that part about pointing and calling because that was the other activity that came to mind. Like I was talking about restaurant work and calling in the tickets that come in. But the right. other thing, really, that that stuck that stuck or came to my mind was being at the range and calling it out every time. Range is hot or whatever, or you know, clear or safety on or whatever it is that you know gets called out in very serious situations like that where complacency can never be an issue or um you know a step can never be forgotten right mm. yeah that just that conscious awareness that that's huge for me it's it's order we're, we're creating order in our mind i that's so huge he talks about this uh at multiple points in the book where where people are indecisive is the way what i would call it right and and basically being vague or costing themselves time or being complacent. This book has really done, done. he's done a good job with this book. I really like this. Thank you for, to Missy, of course, who suggested. <laughs> Stuart, I, I'm sorry, you had the floor. I oh, no, you. that's great. I mean, again, it, I only read three chapters, so I'll let you, you know, cruise through chapter seven, but it sounds like it was the, the inverse of how to break a bad habit. But I like that the chapter five gets into changing our environment, I like the part about the implementation presentation, which is almost like an affirmation, right? Um, and that, uh, uh, you know, when you nail down a time and a place and an action in a motivation, right? You're, the, the odds are the, uh, of you doing the thing are, are greatly increased. And again, part of that's writing it down, part of it's speaking it, but part of it's sort of that naming and claiming it kind of thing, right? And before this, I will do, this or after this, I will do that. Um, and maybe that ties into the um, habit stacking, which I think is cool. Like when I, you know, go to bed, I will brush my teeth or whatever things that you can uh, attach together, things that you normally do. And at first I thought it was like attach a habit that you want to do to a good habit that you already do. But then as I was reading, it was more like attach a habit that you want to do to any other habit doesn't have to be like a neutral habit right and I thought that was cool like when I eat I will after I eat I will go for a run right one is sort of you know something you just do and the other is the one that you're trying to develop I thought that was pretty cool um many people think they lack motivation but we're, what they really lack is clarity and I thought that was cool right about uh that concept of just knowing what you want before you can get what you want or whatever that is, you know, before you make a decision, before you, um, you know, do the thing, you got to decide to do it. She talks about this chain of causes where one decision leads to another and the cue, the reward of one behavior or the, the activity of doing something becomes the cue to do another. And that that's kind of that concept of stacking the way that our, the way that our brain works. And then she kind of gets into what I like, what I would call mental hooks and arranging your workspace in such a way that you, you are surrounding yourself with positive um, cues, right? And so I look at my, I don't have it today, but you know, I got my hat to me, my, my hat means get to work, right? Or if I got a watch on, you know, that's, that's a talisman or whatever. And the, the, you know, I try not to get too into that because you know the danger of course is the thing becomes the crutch but if you can do that in a detached way where your workspace becomes an altar for for lack of a better term where you have special things that make you feel empowered or productive productivity cues or whatever i thought was pretty cool um i see missy and bob hand hand up there so i'll uh i'll let you guys rock and roll keep going man i could listen to you all night oh uh, you're so cool well, what was chapter six? Uh, changing the choice architecture. That was pretty interesting to me. Yeah. Um, almost like manufacturing consent or building consensus, um, right? This concept of, that's what you were talking about, John, about uh, uh, changing, swapping out the soda for water. And so, you know, uh, it's almost like forcing a choice in uh, magic or something like that. You're, you're, removing uh, or you're lessening the, uh, the chance of somebody picking a certain outcome versus another one. Um, environment is the hidden hand that shapes behavior. This concept of context 
and that the, the what did she say the cue is the context and immediately i think of like uh you know back in my teenage years or early 20s or whatever you go out to a bar and have a beer and and the cigarette that goes with it but you wouldn't light up a cigarette unless you go to the bar to have the drink whatever that is that you might do in a social situation that you wouldn't do um you know in a different situation anyway super cool stuff yeah well in that part on chapter six where he talks about context is the cue something that that stuck with me is uh, where he said stop thinking about your environment as filled with objects start thinking about it as filled with relationships so what is my relationship to this object, right? I'm communicating with this object. It's communicating with me. Okay, so we have a relationship. And so in the context of this relationship, I am, am I more or less inclined to drink hot beverages? More inclined because of this relationship. I, see I would even it. say if that was your lucky mug that you made the million dollar sale on, <laughs> whatever it is, that it's that you imbue it with with power, right? So that's your power mug, right? That you when you sit down uh, to work, it, you know. it's not. But okay, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's an overpriced Harley Davidson mug. That's what it is. This is uh, forty dollars or something. So, and it's really and it's really tough. It doesn't break, right? I, I, you know what? I shouldn't say that. It could, <laughs> it could break. I haven't broken it. It's nice. Neither has anyone else. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Missy and Bob, save me. Um, well, what I'm about to say is it's going to be hard for me. Um, I kind of have to go. I, I'm going to undergoing a little bit of confusion. Not, I don't know if that's the right thing, but if that's the right word. But Bob yesterday said to me that I was consumed with the low hanging Etsy, Amazon. Now I got a Facebook thing going. I'm trying to do another uh, affiliate thing. And I, because I found my purpose and I had no idea that I became consumed. And I, but I found out because my body started to crash and I cannot and will not have another relapse, but it, what bothers me is that it took me until that. Hmm. Just, I actually took a day off of not doing something, but actually I did something anyway. But so I have to kind of, I don't know, is it a habit? Is it, am I, do I have to unhabit something? Do I have to, because I just went into it full force, full Italian, full Queens, hmm. full, you know, hmm. and because um, I love it. I just absolutely love it. And I, I found my way, it saved my life, but now I have to back off and learn a better way. And when he said the word you consumed, I, I don't know, it gave me chills that I, what have I done? What did I do to myself? Consumption be done about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on, if you're, if you're purposeful and you're into your work, I, I guess we could consult, we could say that you're consumed by your work, I, I suppose. Um, to the but, point of making my body. Well, so, yeah, I mean, you got to maintain yeah. the body. You need a body to work, right? So, I mean, unless you can do the spirit thing and be a scintillating, you know, vapor and like, you know, just make stuff happen with your intent. I'm not there yet. I'm still working on it. But if you could do that, then who needs the body? I still need a body, apparently. So take care of your body, Missy. <laughs> I'm trying, but I didn't know it. After all I've read, after all I've done, I didn't, I thought I was doing making steps toward worthy uh, goal. I thought I was being successful. No, no uh, look, don't invalidate, well, do whatever you want. Um, but invalidation, I don't know that that, that helps anyone. I'm, what am I invalidating? What are we, what are well, we that, I thought I was making good steps. Well, you are making good steps. You found purpose. You, you found like causation. Okay, great. But and then, you know, maintain the body as well. But I wouldn't invalidate that you found like this great thing that you're so into. Yeah, Missy. Yay. Yay. Right. And now, and now what? Less, less attention on all these other little ankle biting things, which turn into big mountains of problems. Uh, are you the ankle biting thing? I have but, the talking stick. But, but, but the idea, 
Right. The idea that, I mean, you ever see like somebody who's just depressed, miserable, purposeless, purposeless, everything's a problem. Everything. Okay. You want to, you want to get happy? Give them real problems to solve here. Here's problems. Here's work. Do you guys ever see that, that rendition of um, Sherlock Holmes with Robert Downey Jr. And uh, Jude, Judd Law. Great, great movie. I thought. Um, but at one point, um, Sherlock Holmes, the character uh, played by, is that the guy's name, Robert Downey Jr.? Mm -hmm. He's sitting there and he's he's idle and he's he's trying to make a silencer for his revolver and it's not working and uh, he's catching flies or whatever and and uh, and um, uh, Watson walks in and what are you doing right and he opens the windows like oh right <laughs> and he's like give me problems give me work right the guy's sitting there idle. He wants problems, mysteries to solve, right? He was out of work, off purpose. So I applaud you, Missy. Well, thank, thank you. So glad. Please, you know, take care of your body. <laughs> I know, I do. Which I'm saying to me, right? And you get to listen in. I need to take care of my body too. Um, Janet, Janet knows stuff. And then we're going to go to Justin. Hey, Janet. Uh, hey, John. Hi. <laughs> Missy, yeah, you know, you were doing good stuff. It was just finding the balance. That's all, just finding the balance, you know. So um, I way back, and um, Stuart said it too, you know, clarity. Clarity is just a, a really huge thing. Becoming aware of what you're doing, why you're doing it, what clues are are causing you to do it, whether it's a, a thing you want to keep doing or it's a thing you don't want to keep doing, be aware of it. And, um, and one of the things in the mindfulness thing is that, okay, I've made this thing a habit, this is a good thing, but I need to revisit it. I need to reassess once in a while. Is it too much of a good thing? Am I doing too much of it? Am I not doing enough? You know, revisit it. It's not, not like, okay, got that one in there. Now I can go on to the next one. Yeah, you can go on the next one, but come back and visit it again. You know, and he says, um, uh, uh, the process of behavior change is always start awareness. It's, you know, and I this, this weekend, I was in a, a, a shaman uh, summit five hours each day. And, um, and I know I'm more aware of the morning routine and what, because I was kind of floundering and I couldn't find all the whatever. So this morning when I got up, one of the things I did was, well, I'm going to bed earlier and I'm getting better sleep. And I got up earlier and I did several of the things that now I understand the order, I understand the, the whatever. And there are other things in there too, not just the shaman thing, but business things, etc. cetera. So, um, and, you know, coming to John's thing at uh, Awake this morning, instead of, you know, with the sweater over my, my bathrobe and <laughs> trying to look like a real person. <laughs> EVA, it's a different time of day for you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you know, I think that that no matter what you do, and if it's closed in your environment, which is true, I mean, my husband doesn't smoke if he doesn't go out of the house because, yeah, he's not allowed to. But, you know, um, so just I, sometimes I'm happy when he's sick because he's in the house all day and he doesn't smoke. Never mind. Uh, but it's about it's about staying. <laughs> EVA, you're cracking me up. Sorry. Uh, it's about staying. Um, Staying mindful all, all across the board, always. You put things, some things on automatic pilot, revisit them. He doesn't say that, but I think it's, I think it's uh, you know, whatever you're doing, you're, you're building, you're building your empire. But John, really, do you, um, do you not revisit what you have on automatic and, and reassess it from time to time? You're asking me if I do? Yeah, yeah you're John. Uh Sometimes, but, but only if I, if I detect some, something non-optimal about it. Right. So, so I don't, um, so a habit of working out, let's say, for example, okay. I'll sometimes look at, Hey, I've hit this plateau. 
I'd like to do, you know, better, stronger, faster or whatever. All right. Now, what can I deliberately do to modify the already existing resourceful habit, but to get 1% better or, or whatever. Now I'm not intending to go, you know, be a competitive bodybuilder or something. Okay. But you know, the, the older I get, the, I think the more important it is to maintain that habit, um, you know, lest I become I, like my father was complaining about his age when he was 15 years younger than I am now. <laughs> and he's still kicking. Right. Um, but I like to be able bodied. So, uh, so I don't know. I, I mean, I, do I have a goal? Yeah. If I have a goal attached to it, if there's a goal not achieved, I just did this recently, just this morning, I mentioned this in our general session. Uh, I reassessed with my wife, some of the stuff that we were doing ourselves that we're now going to farm out because we're not pleased with the result of that. We can do so much more if we got some leverage from people who are better at doing these things that we don't want to do anyway, right? So let's pay people to do these things and then we can grow it even, even better. And yeah, we're giving up a good amount of profit. I'm talking about bringing on marketers and stuff like that. And, um, and so, and so or, or we could just keep playing the small game. So yes, that's a habit I've habitually produced at this level in these businesses. And now I'm looking at producing at a higher level. So I'm reassessing what are my habits? Are they even serving me? All right. But the thing about a habit is that we're not we're not consciously deciding. So it, we've got to have a good amount of a good ability to to confront our statistics and not just one offs. Like today, I had a crappy day in, in the sales world. Right. I didn't close anything. Actually. Yeah, I, I closed a little bit. OK, but still, it was a very low statistic for me. OK, for other people it might be like, hey, wow, you know, we sold stuff. But um, but for me, it was a it was a low statistic day. However, in the trend, like what Ivier was talking about, she was comparing her trend from 2021 versus 2020. So that's an increase. That's an increased trend. Okay. So it takes a day off. So that's a zero statistic for that day for that particular activity. We're, we're looking at trends, not just, you know, one-off blips. So I guess in that way, the trend can also dictate to us what should we put our attention on. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I was just saying that to, to stay mindful, clarity is great, and to stay mindful of that which you already feel is in place and going. Mm. Uh, you know, so we're, we're, we're talking about EVA now. But, you know, uh, she's staying mindful with her numbers and her steps. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just like, okay, I go out and I do these steps or I walk or I do whatever. It's like staying mindful of it, not just the habit of doing it, but but what are you doing? You know, mm. whatever it is, I, I'm just finding, you know, right now that um, clarity about what I'm doing will help to um, get me in at a better place. That right. Was, Very yeah. good. Thank you, Janet. And not to take it to neurotic extremes, like Bob was describing his guy who's unstable you know, and everything's never good or not. Oh my goodness. And microanalyzing every little thing. Holy crap. Yeah, that's a different story. Yeah. Hey, let's, let's hear from Justin. Justin, hello, sir. Hello. Hi. Hey, I hear you, but I don't see you. No. Uh, so I really like this book, and I, I like uh, Stuart's close readings. I always like that. And I'm in agreement with you, Janet, about staying mindful of things. A couple of things I liked in this book was, was the Diderot behavior or the tendency for one purchase to lead to another called mm. the Diderot effect, where you get into a spiral of consumption. And then uh, I, I like the way the book builds on specific things, but uh, it says your habits change depending on the room you are in and, and the cues in front of you. And I had a friend tell me this weekend, just a uh, uh, volunteer did. He said, uh, did you know that a threshold comes from the word straw? hold the straw was the thresh and the room that they held it in was the hold and eventually in the old times you'd have to be sent to the threshold to get straw for the mud room when you entered the house or bedding area etc and uh, there's this thing in psychology that as you go through a threshold from one room to another that you might forget the reason you entered a room because you have a different relationship with that room. Mm. And so it talks about, um, you know, 
that while well, it goes on and talks about that uh, formula, the behavior is a function of the person and the environment. And the, the environment is the invisible hand of the, that shapes our human behavior. So uh, I just like, like this to, to contemplate that I, my room is a relationship of different things and conversations potentially in my head. A lot of times I don't volunteer because I recognize the stories I'm telling myself based on what conversation has been going on in the room here or what we're reading. And my story doesn't add. It's just, you know, my, my story to, uh, uh, to clear actually is what, what I'm, and so I can create a, a new behavior, but I love doing this uh, every week and every day, being mindful of, of uh, the personal development. And uh, yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Justin. Um, so many, so many great reminders and cues in there, right? He's talking about cues through this whole section of the book. And uh, of course, chapter seven, he talked about the secret to self-control he gave the example of the uh, heroin addicted people, right? I think we already talked about it. Um, but yeah, we notice something, we want it. It's the relationship with this, the stuff in our environment, which has such an influence, which if we're not mindful of it, well, fate, right? What did, what did we call it? Uh, what did Carl Jung call it, right? Oh, it happened to me. Yeah, okay. So um, good stuff, everybody. Any other closing comments before we get into... The second law, make it attractive, which we'll be covering next week, which is three or four chapters. Any other thoughts on this? Uh, Stuart? Stuart? Yeah, there were a couple other things that he said that really, uh, that really hit me. Um, to ask ourselves, uh, does this habit help me become the type of person I wish to become? All right, so that, come, that goes to the how does this serve you kind of thing, but I really... Um, I think that that's an important way to look at uh, our behaviors. And then he says not to blame ourselves for our faults and not to praise ourselves for our successes. And so that also tied in with a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the mindset uh, authors that, that we've been reading, as well as sort of a stoic. I knew you were going to pick up on of, that. Of looking at things, <laughs> yeah, right? and I knew that he, was for Stuart. Right, and there's this thing that he does. <laughs> you uh, list your habits and you assign them a positive, a negative, or a neutral. And that's totally how the Stoics view decision-making about virtue. And uh, uh, it's tied into wisdom. And it's all about, does this decision, you know, uh, is it virtuous? Is it not virtuous? Or is it neutral? And it's almost how they kind of rationalize certain things like um, materialism and acquiring things that really aren't considered virtuous, but are more considered neutral, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But that's a whole other discussion for another time. But yeah, I thought that that was very cool um, that uh, that he brings some of that stuff into it. Don't 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 pat yourself on the back too much, you know. And my I'm a fan of the, the back pat, but I, I can see where it can be a pat, right? I mean, where it can be a trap. You can mm -hmm. give yourself an attaboy or an girl, and, you know, yeah, I did that, but don't, don't live in that or whatever, whatever it is that he's saying, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't get too, too attached. Don't stand back and admire your work for too long or whatever that right. is. Right. Right. That's, that's really great. Stuart, thank you, man. It's always good to hear from you. I, there were a few people in the chat talking about our next, uh, regional get together and uh and Stuart uh was talking about May in Taos going up the going up the trails with the llamas right so everybody can kind of put that in your brain let's start intending that we're getting together in May in Taos New Mexico where I've never been so uh really excited all right guys um thank you for being here. Uh, this is, this is fun. I, I love studying this stuff with you all. We'll get back together next week and cover the next section of the book and um, feel free to invite friends. Uh, of course, this is all brought to you by our, the paying members of the John Lombardia success mastermind, jlsuccessmastermind.com. If you're seeing this on YouTube, go to jlsuccessmastermind.com and get yourself a membership, free memberships. And then after your trial, it's almost free. So 
There you go. Almost free, baby. I'll see you guys real soon. Have a great day. Bye for now.